You lie, motherfuckers. We know what it is. We know what it is. This civilization known as Olmec was the thought all other civilizations in America, the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec, etc. It was even to stretch right out into South America. What is very unusual about this civilization was that not only was it the mother of American civilizations, but it contained elements that were not just native to America, but was a fusion between the Native American and people coming from outside. The most significant of those outsiders were the Africans. We have very clear evidence in stone heads, in terracottas that are clay sculptures, as well as skulls and skeletons of an African physical type entering that native population, somewhere between 948 and 680 BC. Teotihuacan is one of the very places that Andrus Worsinski did analysis of skeletons here in that particular site. And so in conjunction with this, with this art, he found African skeletons that date back to Olmec times. Skeletons. Craniosculpically taking measurements of the skulls here at Teotihuacan, the same place you found that art, the art with the African face, they found the African skeletons there. And in 1974, at a conference in Mexico, he announced the discovery and he wrote, it appeared that some of the skulls from Teotihuacan Sierra de las Masas and Monte Alban, all pre-classic sites in Mexico show a different, show to a different degree a clear pre prevalence of the total negroid pattern that has been evidenced by the use of two methods, multi, uh, uh, multivariate distance analysis of average characteristics of individual fractions distinguished cranioscopically, B, analysis of frequency distributions of mean index of the position between combinations of racial variety. Okay, putting it in the simplest terms. Measured the cranium, found that the cranium of the skulls found in this particular tomb was identical to that of not the Negrito types in uh, Southeast Asia, but of the continental African types. And the, and the uh, variations, as far as the variations are concerned, in many cases, in many instances, he was able to find the African skeleton laying next to the Native American skeleton, a female in most cases, and you can see clearly and could differentiate clearly between the skull of the African and that of the Native American. So this is all he is saying. How do we know the date? It is because on one of the platforms in the holy center and capital of the Almic world, a place called the Benta, we were able to date the stone head because they were rooted in a wooden platform where the Americans worshipped and we got this dating of 948 to 680 BC. Now, several people have wondered what kind of Africans these were. Who were these outsiders? These were largely Egypto-Nubian types. At least that type was in command because what we do find in the evidence is that not merely the presence of this physical type, which is African, but the presence of cultural elements, which we will talk about in this program, which are clearly of Egypto-Nubian origin. This is one of the face more beautiful. You can see the lips, the nose, the eyes. This is completely negroid face, and the weight of this face is 25 tons. And here is the proof for it. It's one of the best proofs I have. This is a figure made that is between the Olmecan period and the Totonacan period, transition period. And this is an Olmec sculpture. And to be black, they covered it with tar. You see, it's a stone head, but it's covered with this tar. So not only the features, and the thick lips come out, primitive, but it is made black. This piece was uh, put on the cover of a uh, um, uh, revista of, uh, in Mexico on March, and uh, shows you that another colossal Olmec head was found in Mexico. It is 100% Negroid uh, features. What we are certain of, what we are absolutely certain of, is that the Olmec civilization, which is the mother of all American civilizations, is not a single-stranded civilization. It does not belong to one race. It does not belong to what we conceive of as the Native American who came across the Bering Straits. There are obvious 
Lee were other influences, and among those influences was the African, specifically the Egypto-Nubian of the Mediterranean. When we look in Von Wutenow's studio, we see quite a number of heads, most of them pre-classic. By pre-classic is meant periods between, say, about 1000 BC going right down to about 600 BC. This is a significant phase in Olmec civilization. There are several phases of the Olmec. When the Mexicans first uh, found a lot of the artifacts and monuments in Mexico, just as this newsletter, just as this document tells us, Yucatan, Egypto, the America. Yucatan, Egypt, in America. This is what they wrote. Why would they say Egypt? La Venta, this site dating back to 1200 BC, brought to light some of the most provocative finds in all of Mexico. Enormous sculpted basalt heads with distinctly Negroid features that still puzzle archaeologists to this day. <laughs> The heads are attributed to the Olmecs, often called the spark civilization of Mesoamerica, the igniters of a creative blossoming that spreads to other cultures. However, the unique style and physical features of the Olmec heads were never imitated and remain a mystery. But see, this is one of the most important points. These heads were never imitated. That means that when they came here, it was a unique experience, a unique situation. These were unique people with unique features who came in and flourished and then disappeared. Showing you clearly that this is a foreign people. The Mayas don't look like this. The Aztecs don't look like this. The Toltecs don't look like this. None of them look like this. This is a foreign incursion in Mexico. When you look at these faces, there is no doubt that they are African. They are no, there is no doubt whatsoever. Thick lips and broad noses. All of these statues identify the fact that our peoples was in this land and a lot of people have covered it up because they have an agenda to teach black people that they have done nothing worthy of what we today call historical uh, achievement. Professor uh, J.M. Melger uh, wrote a paper here in Mexico in 1871. 1871 about the De La Cabeza, Colossal de Tipo Ethiopico the colossal Ethiopian stone face that he had, he had witnessed to. So I'm not going to leave you to uh, hang it. I'm going to put, you, put it all in English. And, 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 and as the scholars would say, in no uncertain terms. We're going to put it in no uncertain terms. On my arrival at the Hacienda, speaking as Mel, Melger, at, my, at the Hacienda, I asked the owner to take me to look at it. We went, and I was struck with surprise. As a work of art, it is, without exaggeration, a magnificent sculpture. But what astonished me uh, was the Ethiopic type represented. I reflected that there had undoubtedly been Negroes in this country and that this had been the first approach of the world. Now here's an anthropologist back in 1871 who has come to this conclusion and has, has written papers on it. But this has been hidden from us. Matthew Sterling, they're just digging these things up all over the place in that area, all around the Gulf Coast. Standing there, all standing there in shock, looking at it. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> then he starts measuring it, looking at the nose, knowing it's nothing like his nose. Look at his nose. <laughs> look at his nose. And look at the nose on this. Look, look at his lips and look at the lips on this. Look at his cheek. And his receding cheek, here's a prognathous cheek, all of the dimensions that he's measuring, clearly seeing that this is different. And his original position was that these were African, and when the scholarly world, the schools and universities, and then the supporting money got to him, he changed his story, Mr. Matthew Sterling. You know what it is. You know what it is. How can you get a face like that? What in Africa? Nah, motherfucker. You know what it is. We know what it is.
from our history to keep us in a slave mentality. But today we are waking up, we are doing the research, and we are identifying our people and our history on all the continents. You lie, motherfuckers. We know what it is. We know what it is. The Olmecs came into their sites pretty early, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo, as early as 1200 BC at La Venta. You must look carefully at this map and see the diamond points. Those are the capitals. And those diamond points show you where the Olmec first made their major settlements. 1858 was the discovery at Tres Zapotes of a stone head. Now this is the stone head. This is the first head to be discovered. Now look closely at this head. When the Mexicans saw this head, when their scholars saw this head, scholars like Orozco Ibera, Jose Melgar, etc., they were absolutely convinced that there were Africans in America at some ancient time. Why were they convinced? They were convinced by two things by the African physiognomy, the, na the, the, the dome of the forehead, the, the cut of the nose, the, the, the jaw, the mouth, etc., but also by something which has never been mentioned in the archaeology for some odd reason. And that is, at the back of the stone head, there was hair, detailed Ethiopian type here. No Native American has hair like that. Here we are looking at the seven uh, braids that was found on the back of one of the Olmec heads to show the Africanness in his culture. And looking at the brother to the right with the same type of African braid. See the braids? See the braids, the seven glorious braids. That seven, that seven is sacred to the Nile Valley. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you see the brothers right now today, still rocking the same hairdo. That's in the back. That's in the back of that that face right there. Motherfuckers had African braids and not French braids. So these are cultural characteristics of these people. These features are, are characteristics of our people. They go hand in hand. To find this head in America, pre-Columbian, at part of the Olmec civilization, is a testimonial to who these foreign people were. You have to consider this evidence. In this particular site, Tautielco, they found this. Look at the afro on this face, on this head. Look at the afro. The peppercorn hair, as they call it. The lips, the nose. Again, who else, who else, who else in the world has this type of feature? around and look at each other. Completely alien features here at La Venta. And I like to shoot the profiles of them because a lot of times they like to just shoot them straight on so you can't see the prognathous jaw, the thick lips and the noses, the characteristics again that you would anticipate amongst African people and African people in the diaspora. We move on, we can see here, as my wife sits here, you can see clearly her features in conjunctions of the features here. Again, a totally, look at the prognathous jaw here and the lips here, completely alien completely alien to that of the Americans, the Native Americans here. Now look at the profile here, look at this, look at the jaw here. Now I take you to Kemet, to Harmachus. The only people in the world who are sculpting massive stone heads anywhere in the world other than this, and they're building pyramids. How did these Africans get here? A lot of people saying that they're navigators. Move on, we can see the, the first boats in recorded history. These are the oldest paintings of any boat on the earth. Going back 4000 BC in Nubia. With the goddess, the symbol of the goddess Hathar here, the great mother here. Again associated with navigation. This heritage coming all the way from the interior of Africa to Egypt, right to Greece, right to Rome. The queen of heaven, the queen of navigation, the queen of the waters. Here's the oldest boat known with a sail on it. Going back before 3000 BC, nowhere in the world did anybody even in the world paint a picture of a boat with a sail on it. Here's 3000 BC, a boat with a sail on it in Nubia, not in Egypt. And you can see, even in the spirit of the people there today, the little brothers, the little Nubians playing with boats, because the Nile was the life of Egypt. 
there could be no life in Egypt without this river. We're talking about a period about 2300 BC. We're talking about nearly, we're talking about 4,300 to 4,500 years ago that they had ships like this with sails on it, navigating throughout the Mediterranean world. It's not a canoe. They had larger ships than this. They were shipping obelisks all the way down from the interior of Africa. The oldest known shipwreck in the world found, an Egyptian ship off the coast of Crete. National Geographic, not Brother Mathu. And we do have evidence of the Egyptians in the Pacific. We have Egyptian script found in Hawaii. These guys are ranging far out. Nothing stops the Egyptian. Wherever you go, you find him. I have found him in Spain. They have Egyptian villages in Spain. Where Barry Fell has shown the cartouches of the Libyan kings around 1000 BC are found at Almuneca, Spain. And that runs right through the, the, the Spanish mention in their early chronicles that Tahaka, the Nubian general who is later to become the king of Nubia and Egypt, enters Spain in a, with the garrison so that the Africans are already in Europe. They're invading. They come in with the garrison into Spain and then they retreat back because they have their own problems at home. Clearly, we have evidence of some kind of body of people who came into the Olmec world at that time. And there is a reason for this because people have asked, okay, fine. All right, people can cross the Atlantic, fine. You have proven they have boats, fine. But why did they come here? Egyptians have no business in the Atlantic. The Atlantic is very, very far from Egypt. And Egyptian ships have no right in the Atlantic circa 800 BC. The reason why they are in the Atlantic at all, in the North Atlantic, is because of an unusual situation that is, an occurring, that is occurring in the Mediterranean at that point in time. It is very important, therefore, not only to study what was happening in Mesoamerica, but to study what was happening at that point in time in Egypt and Nubia. What you have is a war going on between Africa and Asia. The Asiatics are attacking everyone in the Mediterranean. They're, they have smashed the Hittites. They have taken iron smelting process from the Hittites. They have smashed the Phoenicians. They have made vassals of the Phoenicians who are, have always been servants of the Egyptians and the Nubian. Fifty percent of the Egypto-Nubian navies are, have, are Phoenician. This type is restless up and down the Mediterranean. It has its cities at Tyre and Sidon, its great ports, but it's restlessly moving up and down the Mediterranean. And because the Asiatics block the seaports to the Indian Ocean, block the seaports to the Pacific, and we do have evidence of the Egyptians in the Pacific, that is the reason why many of the great heads have military helmets. Not all of them do, but they are distinguished by military helmets. They are a warrior dynasty because this is a period of war. So the Egyptians were the masters of war. They saw their entire existence bordered and hinged on the concept of water. The water that the woman gave birth to the child's the inundation process began as the child came bellowing out of her interior. The concept of the water as they would sail up and down the highways doing commerce, then the south commerce in the north. And when they died and went to heaven, the boat to take them back to the interior of Africa. If anybody on the face of the earth could make the trip to America, we know it was the Egyptians. Nothing could stop the Egyptians. So Thor Heyerdahl, European, he knew that. And so what he did, he, he looked at these boats, these Egyptian vessels, and he chose the most primitive type, the papyrus reed, and said, I'm going to prove that the ancient Egyptians could sail to America. This was his, this was his uh, calling. This is what he wanted to do. So you can see he looked at the brothers, clearly see that they were brothers, and didn't look anything like him. And so what he did is he said, okay, they don't look like me. Let me go find some people who look like them. So he went to Chad in the interior of Africa and he found some brothers who looked just like the brothers on the boat who were making the same kinds of boats and he brought these brothers back to Egypt and built a boat right in front of, and right in front of the pyramids in Egypt. Why didn't we get this in class? Hyredon understood that the reason that white folks couldn't get across to America and they thought the world was flat is that they were traveling against the currents. 
And that if you travel along the currents of, of uh, West Africa, the currents would bring you right to America. Anything that was able to stay afloat would come naturally to America. A bottle, a person, anything that could stay afloat would naturally come to America. He knew that. So he knew that white folks, in fact, had not discovered the whole world. So the white folks thought the world was flat. And you can see here, it's not Brother Batu making this up. In 1492, their science was in such a state that they believed that the world was flat and that if you sail off into the Atlantic, you'll fall off the edge of the earth or be devour devoured by some hideous monster. <laughs> this was the extent of their science at this particular time in the year 1492. The first Africans in the Americas came from the Nile Valley. Primarily where people land is going to be where they first set up their civilization. So these peoples came across the water from Africa. You can look right at them and see that they're African people, okay? And this, this is an African from the west coast of Africa. A lot of them came from the east coast also. We're gonna go to the old Macs. Now, what we know about the old Macs is that they are the mother culture of the Americas. There is no culture with uh, architecture, with writing, with tombs, with pottery, that we can say ha uh, uh, people that predate the old man. There is none. They have the oldest architecture, they have the oldest writings right here in the Americas. And we're going to prove that with documentation. But as you can see, and if you look, this is just one uh, carving of an old Mac. You can see from what we can see today that is an African. Wide nose, okay? The thick lips. And we're going to get into some of the hairs that they found. But the uh, area in which the old Mac's head, headquarters uh, was right around Veracruz or the, uh, one of the other uh, counties in Mexico called Tabasco. That's right down here in this region. I had an opportunity to get down here. And what's significant about that is that we will look and we will see that a lot of the currents uh, in the Atlantic moving from Africa to America, some of those currents, if you get in it, it'll bring you right up in to what you call the Gulf of Mexico. And so that's very significant that the old Mex, which I'm going to document, a lot of their knowledge come up out of the Nile Valley. Okay? It's enough, uh, it's enough documentation, it's enough evidence where, you know, we ain't got to play no games about our peoples coming over here. When you look at this photo, look at this sister, look at her lips, and look at the old Mac lips, and his nose, and look at her nose. It is almost identical. This woman looked like she could have either been the mother of that old man or his sister. Here is another photo of a West African brother. Young brother. And if you look in the face, if you look in the lips, and you look in the nose, there is no doubt that that brother and that old man is from the same race. Now right here, what it's saying right here, oldest new world riding find, okay? Uh, ancient civilizations in Mexico developed a writing system as early as 900 BC. The inscriptions are thought, are thought to have been made by the Olmecs, an ancient pre-Columbian people known for creating large statues of heads. Researchers tell Science Magazine they consider it to be the oldest example of writing in the New World. Okay, now we're looking at Idi Amin. This is the old Max. Okay, we don't have to hesitate about who these peoples were. You understand what I'm saying? That just the, that's African. And the, the, as much as African as Idi Amin is the old man. You understand what I'm saying? It's identical in phenotype. Okay, and as we look at the document previous, it documents that these was the Africans that brought language into the Americas. Here, look at Joe Lewis, and look at that brother right there. Matter of fact, at this old man, you can even see, you know how niggas when they only line their shit up, and your shit come to a point, you understand? Yeah, you can see it right up in there, right there, okay? 
You understand what I'm saying? So we can see the phenotypes in the old Macs is the same as the Africans. Okay, there is no civilization where the African did not start. We were on every continent before any goddamn race appeared. And we have the goddamn evidence. When you go into Asia, it's the woolly haired Buddhas. When you go into Americas, it's the African, the strong African features of the old Max. When you go into Africa, when you go into Egypt, it's the strong African features that was on the Sphinx. So this is the so-called Mayan calendar. The Mayan ain't got no goddamn calendar. Right. They ain't never been here long enough to do the calculations. Yeah. So when you go look up, the, all you have to do is Google the Mayan. They're going to give you right around the time when, when they think the Mayan came on the scene. Now look at the goddamn uh, beginning date for the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar started around 3000 BC, but the Mayan are a AD people. How the hell did they do the calculations? They couldn't have done it. So the reason why you see that the middle of this stone, which is the OMAC calendar, just like the nose is missing there, it's for a reason. It's just like why the reason the nose is missing here. It was African. Okay? You even see Bess, the oldest now valley deity, with the leopard skin. Now when you this is a photo to the left that I took when I was at Tihucan, where which is the largest pyramid field in the Americas, immediately I looked and I said, that's best. You see the feathers that's coming out the top of his head. You see his tongue sticking out. And uh, uh, many of the photos with best, you'll see that almond shape in his eye. So you, you have best. Not only do you see the pyramids, you see a lot of the Nile Valley deities carved on the, on the stone of them pyramids. Now a lot of people say the Mayans got a calendar. They ain't got no damn calendar. That's the Egyptian calendar. And if you look very, very close, you will see that that in the middle is best. That's best with his tongue sticking out. Showing you the origin of where this knowledge came from. It is the Egyptian Nubian calendar. Matter of fact, it's actually the Nubian calendar. So when you look in the middle of this so-called Mayan calendar, Omec calendar, which is nothing but the Nubian Egyptian calendar, it is the first and oldest god of the Nile Valley. It is best sitting right there in the middle of the stone. So this is the this is the Indian type. This is the Mexican type. The one that want to try to claim that the Omec is them. And you can see right here with this Indian type when it stood right next to a phenotype that looked just like him. He didn't go stand next to the old Mac one. He didn't go stand to the, because he know damn well that does not look like him. But this one right here got his nose, got his lip, got his head. That is him. Okay? Again, showing you time and time again. We can put it right here. We can prove without no doubt that our people had come here and that the, pe the Africans from the Nile were the forerunners of all civilization. The Olmec head, right here. And what you're looking at right here, you can see the slime in their eyes. See the slime in their eyes? Some of them have slats in their eyes. Okay, this is Anchor Wat. You understand what I'm saying? If y'all here, y'all can Google that in. Anchor Wat, Cambodia, and then the heads will come up and you'll see the slats in their eyes. But they all got thick lips. These was the, uh, uh, some of the early Africans in Asia, you understand, that had this particular persuasion. It was, it, you know, in different parts of the world, different Africans congregated. We are African, but in many areas we had Africans with the slime eyes, long before the Chinese. Ain't none of them ever had, every phenotype you see on this planet, we was able to produce before any of the red races came along. We produce them right here in our own race. Okay, let me look at this. This, I'm, I'm in Hotel the Third. You see the slants in his eyes. Okay, just like you see the West, uh, in, in, in the West, in Cambodia, you also see in Egypt. Who are these people? The, these are the, uh, 
see the Khoisan in southern, southern Africa, you can see the slats in their eyes. Okay? So, I mean, that, that man look like he could be over in Southwest Asia somewhere. You know what I'm saying? So all these phenotypes, all of these phenotypes are African. So you, most people will look at, see a lot of them, they look at that and then they, they automatically, they want to run to Asia. Well, that's some Asian, that's a goddamn lie, that's African. Quit lying, goddamn it. So these peoples came across the water from Africa. You can look right out and see that they're African people, okay? This is an African from the west coast of Africa. A lot of them came from the east coast also. Now look at the old men. These are the, this is the oldest civilization in America. See the brother? Do it look just like him? All right. Y'all looking stone. I'm going to go on. See that? See that motherfucker? That look just like him. Okay? You come back? You understand what I'm saying? So you got some motherfucking Mexicans that say, this is a, this is a phenotype from the Mexican race. I heard Mexicans say that shit. They try to argue that shit. But yet and still, goddammit, you can go and look right next to, to this motherfucker and you can see that's him. Now, if they got a motherfucker that look like him, why don't they produce it right now today? Show up, motherfucker. Show me a motherfucker. If he ain't got no nigga in him, goddammit, I don't know what he is. That's an African right there. See that? See the lips? See the nose? They're going to tell me and you that the motherfucking tools where they cut the man's face, they was bloody. They weren't sharp enough. They couldn't, they, couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't get the cuts on the motherfucker, right? To get it right. Nah, but they got the cuts on that motherfucker right there, huh? Huh? You lying, motherfuckers. We know what it is. We know what it is. Now look at it. See the old Saurian pole with their arms crossed? How the hell is all of this shit coincidence? That, that, that lets you know that they have passed on. That's how, and, and motherfuckers still do it right now today. When they, when they drop you down in the coffin, they cross your arms. That's an ancient. That's ancient. That, that means you're going to resurrect. If you done done right, you'll resurrect. If not done right, you won't resurrect. We're going to get rid of your ass. That's what they did in Africa. So you can see this one being in America. This is too tight common. This one being in, the, in Africa. Now, when I was in Mexico, the first thing I noticed about this, see, you have to look at it for a minute. That's a damn elephant. No goddamn elephants in the Americas. How did it get over here? The Africans brought that over here. Ain't no damn elephants in the Americas. The only elephants in the Americas are the ones that's brought, brought over here by ships. That's it. So you can see right here, the fact that there is no elephants in the Americas is another testimony of the African origins of America's early civilization. So what, this is what the brother is talking about, how these brothers came across the Atlantic, the Indian, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, by boat, taking this knowledge all over the ancient world. The deformation of the head, something that's done all over West Africa. In fact, look at the earring here. And go back and look at the ear here. It's almost identical. You can see the deformation that took place. They do this at birth. When the child is born, they, they uh, fasten sticks and they tie it in some manner so that they can create the shape when the brain, when the skull is still soft. So you can see it's done all over Africa, particularly in West Africa. Cultural characteristics coming across to America. When you look at something like this, then you understand how something like this gets to America pre-Columbian. Again, they're rep the artists are representing things that they understood, things that they could differentiate from themselves. You can see much of it still here even to this day as you go into the Amazon and you find these things being done that are being done nowhere else but in Africa. So this is uh, our final slide. Now one, another uh, uh, painting that identified the origin of the Omet and how they passed that knowledge down to the Aztec, Incan, and Mayan was the smiting of the enemy where the king grabs 
his enemy by the hair and be and prepares to take off his head. And you see this here to the left with the Mayan king mimicking the Nile Valley, the Egyptian Nubian king right here, Ramesses II. This is a this is a fact that cannot be disputed. So we are identifying that the culture that you see in the Americas originally come from the Nile Valley. The priests began to adorn themselves in the regalia that you would expect to see in Kemet. As you see the symbol of the serpent, not only on the shield behind him, but the uraeus above his head and wearing the skin of the jaguar. Look at the leopard skin again that is worn by the Egyptian priest. And again, look at the Aztec priest that wear the jaguar skin. Look at the smiting of the enemy by Narma that had been carried all the way up into the Americas while they, where they try to copy from the Sukhans of the Nile Valley. Look at Bess in the all Mac calendar with his tongue sticking out. Bess was worshipped all over the planet Earth. The, the, the mural to the left is from Teotihuacan in America. Bess was worshipped all over the world. Here is showing in San Corre Timbuktu the pyramid and in Guatemala the pyramid showing how it left Africa and went into the America. Here we're looking at the cap of Pata. The, the cap that was also worn by his son, the multi-genius Imhotep. This is blatant evidence that the worship of Pata along with many other Nile Valley deities was in the land. We're even looking at their prayer formations. We're even looking at their prayer formations. This is something that cannot be overlooked. When you look at Tehuti, what I want you to, uh, to look deeply at is the saturations in his headdress. Look at the saturations in his headdress and then look at the right to the Omec representation of Tehuti, you see those same saturations in the top of the Ibis, the sacred Ibis of what we call Tehuti, Jehudi. Again, we're looking at the symbolic meaning of Tehuti in the Omec of Mayan culture here. Omec being the mother culture of all civilizations in the Americas, the mother culture. And we can easily go into the artifacts that were left by the Omex and see where Tehuti and Ptah was one of the major deities being worshipped here in the so-called Americas. Again, we're looking at the sacred baboon, sacred to Tehuti. We're looking at the Ibis, and again, the sacred baboon of Tehuti, proving without any doubt that his great wisdom as the deity of all sacred wisdom in the Nile Valley had come to the Americas and was one of the front deities in the craft system right here on these, these shores and in these lands that we call the Americas. Now on the right is the Aztec priest. What you see on the top of his headdress, a falcon. The worship of Heru. All of these deities, you got to understand that all of these deities from the Nile Valley had come to the Americas. And one way or form, shape, or, or another, that all the Nile Valley deities were being worshipped in the Americas. This is not a coincidence. You find pyramids. You, feel, you find the same deities on the wall. You, you find the same animals uh, uh, intertwined in the religiosity. This is no coincidence. Quetzalcoatl, the flying serpent. We also see that that originated in the Nile Valley. We also see that the flying serpent originated in the Nile Valley. Looking at this creation uh, photo, a shoe holding up heaven, and, 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 the, and the goddess new represented as heaven, if you look to the top, the left and the right, you will see the two winged serpents, which the, uh, 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 the Omec brought to the Americas, in which they call Quetzalcoatl. 
Now on this vid, look at the dead center of the Incan headdress. And you will see the eye of Ra, the eye of Heru in the middle of his headdress. So when you're looking at Teotihuacan, you got to understand that it's nothing but a replica of the Giza Plateau. But it, uh, it is a lesser technology, much lesser than what was in the Nile. This is looking at it from the top, showing that it is a step pyramid. It is a, that's exactly what it is, a step pyramid. For many people, it is hard to understand that even the feather that was worn by the so-called Indian is a practice that was brought here by the Africans. The feather was worn by the first people of the planet Earth, the Twa, which Europeans derogatorily called pygmy. The Twa carried the way of the feather as a rite of passage all the way down the Nile to Nubia and Kemet. This rite of passage was deified even in Ma'at and even in Amun with his two plumes atop his headdress. Best, in many cases, is shown with a full head of feathers, as many chiefs in the so-called Americas also wore. Notice you had to be of rank to wear feathers, which shows it was a part of manhood, a part of the sacred craft. Even the totem pole, where one places their deity or god on top of a staff, notice here, the eagle atop of this totem pole. When you come into the Nile Valley at 3200 BCE, the practice is already ancient. As you see here with Narma, the very first Sultan or Pharaoh of Kemet. The twelve represented in Bess are carrying the totem poles. The first two have Heru, the falcon, up top. Here again is an Egyptian Kemetic priest carrying a totem staff or pole with Heru, the falcon god, atop. And here again is a so-called American totem with the eagle atop. Is this a coincidence? I think not. Ask yourself, why do teepees form a true pyramid? Because of the worship of the Nile Valley priests who brought with them the sciences and mysteries of Saqqara, the Giza Plateau, the Nubian mysteries of Napata, Kerma, and Nuri. Imhotep, around 2700 BCE, became the first architect to build a structure of any kind above ground made out of cut stone blocks. What can y'all see about that? I, I, I mean, family, come on, what do you see? What do you see from ancient Egypt? You're right, hey Ru. Yes, sir, you're right, you're correct. You, you did. This is the Shem Suharu. This is the Horus kings that came down and conquered Egypt. Okay, so these symbols, we got we got totem poles, we got Haru signs with, with Ra above his head. We were the first to come with the, the, the sacred bird. You understand what I'm saying? With the divine symbol of Ra over his head. We came from the earliest American writing on earth. Let me bring it forward. Scientists say they have found evidence in Mexico that an ancient people developed a, 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 a writing system more than 2,500 years ago. They say that the inscriptions on a cylinder-shaped seal and fragments of a plaque indicate that the Olmec people, who? The Olmec. Use a form of words in about 650 B.C. Well, then, let me ask you something. Now, see, I, I, listen. I love debate. That's what I do. So I always find a, a, the, weakest, the weakness in a man's argument using his own words. Now, they say that the calendar is the Mayan calendar, right? right. But yet it still it says that the Olmec people, you, was the first to bring language. If the Mayan created the calendar before the Olmec, yes. what language was he using? Good question. What language was he using? The old man came first. How you did all of I mean, how you did all of goddamn calculations, man? <laughs> Come on, people. It take a people of many hundreds of thousands of years 
develop high technology like that. It's passed down from one people to another, one generation. This is about 350 years earlier than the writings of credit to the Mayan civilization. That's damaging. That's a big, for, big statement. That's damaging for all you 2012 niggas. That's very damaging because it show you how the, the Mayan wasn't even on the scene. And the, the, the calculations go back 3000 BC. The only people that could have created a calendar that goes back 3000 BC is a people that lived, physically lived 3000 BC, not somebody just coming on the scene. Okay? You can't be the Mayan people documented to have been a people of the AD period doing research for a calendar that go back 3000 BC. You wouldn't hear to do the damn calculations. You wasn't here. So you're still in the damn credit. Now when we come to a lot of the paintings on the wall, what you should be focusing on is the fact that the Mayan and the Aztec, Aztec priests, they wore the Jaguar skin. Where did they get that from? If you go back into the Nile, the Nile Valley priests wore the leopard skin. So it's, it, 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 when it got here in the Americas, the, the origin of the knowledge was the same, but they used animals that was indigenous to the area where they came from. They substituted the African animal with animals that was indigenous, indigenous to the Americas. Here is one of the Aztec priests painted black. And here to the right is a Aztec today continuing on that culture that was brought where they paint themselves up to look just like the original uh, uh, culture bringers that brought them that culture. They still paint themselves up to look like the great God of Saw. This is who they're trying to mimic. This is who they're trying to mimic. They are trying to mimic the great God of Saw. And there are many codex, there are many paintings that show the blacks in these lands. Here again, you see a black, he has a beard, but again, you see him with that jaguar. Uh, skin on his back, mimicking the Nile Valley Africans who wore the leopard skin. On this photo, pay very attention to the serpent at the top of the Maya's head, where, where he's mimicking our kings of the Nile Valley who wore the cobra above their brow to strike fear in their enemies. This was the great goddess, Wajet. The great goddess that strikes fear in the enemies of the Pharaoh. The next photo, pay very attention to the Omek on the right. Look at his headdress. It is very, very similar, if not exact, to the Nehemiah's crown of the ancient Nile Valley Sultans. Look very clear. And here is also where it's so much exact, it is no doubting that the, to the right, that the Omec is wearing the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, even in the Americas. We're not doubting where this knowledge came from. The first Africans in the Americas came from the Nile Valley. Tiwanaku and the Sphinx were both built around suggest to some that a sophisticated group of seafaring people crossed the Atlantic thousands of years before Columbus. What we're looking at here is a common influence that touched all of these places in Egypt. It had a presence in Mexico, that had a presence in South America and elsewhere, and that left behind a legacy of knowledge in all of those places.